from the heart of Dubai, where tomorrow is being built today to the world. Welcome to the CTO Show with Mehmet. Here, we redefine technology and reimagine possibilities. With Mehmet, delve into the riveting realms of AI, cybersecurity, and digital technology. Experience the thrilling highs and lows of startups. Immerse yourself in the spirit of entrepreneurship and witness the future of business innovation being written in real time. Now, without further ado, let's tune in and explore the future. Hello and welcome back to a new episode of the CTO Show with Mehmet. Today, I'm very pleased to have with me bestseller author and the long time consultant, Mark Rubin, who is joining me from the US today. Mark, thank you very much for your time and being here on the show today. You are one of the top voices on LinkedIn. A lot of people knows you, but just in case, you know, if someone sees you or is listening to you first time, can you just introduce yourself to the audience? Yeah, well, sure thing, Mehmet. And thank you uh, for the invitation to be here. Thank you for the kind introduction. Um, my name is Mark Raven. Um, try to summarize kind of you know, my background and what I do now. So uh, I'm an engineer, industrial engineer with an MBA. Uh, I thought I, I, was, I wanted a career in, in manufacturing and that's, that was the focus of about the first 10 years of my career. Enjoyed it, but then ended up having an opportunity in 2005 to, to do work in healthcare, um, you know, mm. hospitals and different healthcare settings, trying to apply um, engineering and systems improvements principles, management practices, um, kind of coming from manufacturing um, into healthcare. And so, you know, nowadays uh, I do a number of things. I have my own company where I do uh, writing and publishing, speaking, um, some coaching and consulting. Um, I've also been uh, affiliated in different ways with a technology company, uh, a software company called Kinexus um, for about, um, gosh, 12 years now as that company has grown. So never, never a full-time role with Kinexus, but um, involved in different ways. I have a small ownership stake. And, you know, as I have a chance to share a little bit in the book, you know, I think really proud of the culture that the co-founders and other leaders at Kinexus have built. And maybe that's something that we can delve into today. So my, my career has certainly taken different turns than I wouldn't have expected, you know, an earlier stint with the startup in the early 2000s. That was a totally different um, you know, approach, um, you know, a different era of entrepreneurship, I guess, but then, you know, longer stint here with Kinexus, including, you know, the present day. So that's kind of a summary of, of what I do. I do podcasting. I've written and published a number of books, including my new one, um, The Mistakes That Make Us. That's great. Thank you very much for sharing this uh, with us. And, you know, like, have you answered my first question, by the no. way, right. you know, about, you know, the transition, because the first thing I wanted to ask you about, you know, what inspired you actually to do this transition from an engineer to, to you know, going into the path you are in today and, you know, helping businesses from a consulting pers perspective. Um, but, you know, one of the things I want to ask you, because usually as consultants, you know, we have to deal with multiple sectors. So for yourself, it was from manufacturing to healthcare to technology. So how you can, you know, describe this experience and how it actually enriched your overall also like knowledge and, you know, the way you, you deal with your clients? Yeah, I mean, I think there's, there's a couple dimensions to what you're asking there. One is going from being an employee of companies to, to being a consultant. That transition wasn't, as difficult because I, I was always in an internal consulting role, um, focused on uh, improvement projects of different types, focused on helping implement elements of uh, a lean culture, if you will, you know, lean management approach mm -hmm. in organizations. I've, I've only had two, I will admit to having only two very short stints as being technically a people manager, um, but, you know, always working with leaders in organizations to, to help them um, with improvement. And so then you know, I had an opportunity into, well, the first technology company, a lot of that was sort of a consulting role with the software customers. But then uh, again, 2005, getting to join uh, this consulting team within Johnson & Johnson. Mm -hmm. that had a, a consulting group that worked with medical laboratories and, and hospitals, 
you know, I think people in healthcare wouldn't have hired me, the individual, but they were willing to hire Johnson and Johnson. And, you know, that was a great team um, to come be a part of and, and to build trust and um, build some experience with, with healthcare organizations. But, you know, I think it's interesting whenever we look at trying to bring ideas from one sector to another, it's, I think it's sort of natural that people might be a little defensive. Um, Good idea. You know, uh, you know, Eric Reese and others bringing ideas from Toyota into technology companies under the label of lean startup. Like sometimes people are defensive and say, well, you know, technology companies are, are different. I'm like, well, that's true, but we can still maybe come to agreement that ideas are transferable. People in healthcare are right. absolutely correct when they say, well, hospital, a hospital is not a factory. I'm like, well, that's a true statement. Patients are not cars. And, you know, I think we have to be careful, um, you know, if we're, if we're pushing tools in, in too literal of a, um, you know, a transfer from one industry to another, we could get in trouble because we might end up misapplying the tool if we're using it in a different context. But I think when we're transferring uh, principles and mindsets and behaviors, I think that's much more transferable. So, you know, lean and healthcare does not mean treating the patient like a car. It means treating the patient <laughs> better than they might be treated today. And it means taking care of the people doing the work in that right. setting. So I, I think, I mean, look, I've, I've made mistakes, I'm sure, going from one setting to another, but I, I try to be mindful of not forcing change on people, but to try to help bring them along to understand yeah. that, okay, these ideas are transferable or let, let, let's try it and see. Yeah. Yeah, you you talked about lean a lot, and I'm you know fan of you know the 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 whole you know because there are like other concepts before lean, you know, and I I always share some quotes from uh, the lean startup uh, from Eric uh, book, and you know it has its own roots in manufacturing may, mainly we know this, but it starts to apply also on startups. Now, from your experience, and you talked about like applying it to healthcare. Do you think it is also relevant to apply it on any kind of startups and also maybe even on small, medium businesses? I, I, yes, I, I would say so. And I, you know, I can point to, you know, experience with, uh, with Kinexus over, you know, the last 12 years as uh, a startup that's now evolved into, I mean, it's still a high growth, uh, you know, small, it's still a small company. Um, it's not a unicorn, but that's okay. Not every, not every startup has to be um, a, a unicorn. But you know, within Kinexus, there are a number of applications of, of key principles that we would say are inspired by Toyota or Lean. You know, um, a couple of them being you know, this, uh, this idea of customer focus. Mm -hmm. That's something that exists or should exist in, in every setting of making sure you, know, you really deeply understand your customers' needs, that you realize that um, customers define value. Um, they, they vote with uh, their purchase decisions. Um, I, I think, you know, internally, there are practices related to, let's say, agile software development of, of doing, you know, smaller batches, more iterative development and releases of technology um, and new versions of, um, you know, a web-based software. But I think internally in the culture, you know, as I as I highlight in the book, you know, from from the beginning, Kinexus was very focused on trying to, you know, foster and cultivate uh, a culture of continuous improvement, which is an idea that comes from Toyota and other organizations. Our customers, our Kinexus customers, are trying to build a culture of continuous improvement. That's what our software helps support. So, mm -hmm. a culture of continuous improvement embraces a number of mindsets, including you know, the idea of not being too proud of what you have or the way you do things, that everything can be improved and that there's no shame in that. There's, um, you know, people are encouraged and celebrated uh, for, for pointing out opportunities for improvement internally. You know, we have a new sales executive who's um, going through his onboarding. And I heard him talking the other day about part of his onboarding specifically asks him and other new employees to point out opportunities for improvement in the onboarding process. Like we're trying to instill that from the beginning that um, everything can be improved. Everybody has a voice. And as we 
you really highlight in the book, I think part of that culture of continuous improvement, another element that comes from Toyota is a culture of psychological safety, a culture of mm -hmm. learning from mistakes, of um, it, not, not just encouraging, but rewarding people for speaking up in different ways. That's to me what, what helps drive employee satisfaction. It helps you retain talent. It helps you be more innovative and, and more successful. Yeah company. So, you know, we're not trying to copy all of the detailed technical tools from Toyota, mm -hmm. really more about the culture. Yeah. And uh, like spot on, because speaking of culture now, in your opinion, how, you know, leaders, because some leaders, sometimes they struggle to create this environment where, you know, they feel safe. I can share my ideas. Um, maybe the boss will be angry, will be mad. Maybe they will mock my idea. So how do you think leaders can create, you know, this safe environment as you, you, you describe it to foster such culture? Yeah. Well, I think, you know, there's, there's two main pieces and I'll, I'll give credit, uh, Timothy Clark, who is the, uh, a researcher, author of a great book called the four stages of psychological safety. I I've learned a lot, uh, from Tim formally and informally and, you know, cite and credit him in, in the book. And I, and I think Clark, I think Tim Clark is really insightful in saying there's really two main things that leaders need to do to help others feel safe in the workplace. So one is modeling the behaviors that you want to see. So for example, when, when a leader like um, Greg Jacobson, who's uh, one of the co-founders and CEO of Kinexus or other leaders at Kinexus admit mistakes openly, they admit when they're wrong, and, and they don't do that to shame themselves. They do it in the spirit of transparency and learning mm. and growth, right? So if somebody admits a mistake, part of that discussion is, well, he, here's why I made the decision I did. Here's why I think it didn't pan out. Maybe I made a bad assumption. Here's the learning and here's the adjustment and here's what we do different moving forward. So like leaders leading by example, I think mm -hmm. is a very important first piece. And then the second piece is what you were touching on, Mehmet, is then uh, rewarding others for following your lead, right? So if the CEO admits mistakes because they probably feel safer to do so, and let's say unless the board or the investors get upset with them, right? The CEO um, has more built-in safety probably because of their position. They can yeah. then encourage and, and, and set the tone for employees who might be a little bit afraid to speak up, not because they're afraid of Greg or other leaders at Kinexus, but they have they maybe have experiences at other companies where they okay. did get in trouble for challenging the status quo or for saying things could be better. And so modeling those behaviors, encouraging others to lead the way, but then making sure as a leader that you react and respond in ways that are rewarding as opposed to punishing. That, that starts building, I think, kind of a, a positive cycle of uh, you know, strengthening psychological safety over time. Yeah, I think, you know, we have seen also some companies that they deployed this successfully in their culture, right? Like where even they give their uh, teams time to work on projects that they know previously that these projects might be fail a failure. And sometimes I remember like I had one guest who, who talked about you know, the Amazon day one approach, for example, also like where, you know, like, because if they reach day two, that means like they, they are doing some mistakes over there. It's really like, you know, the culture I believe is something very important to mm -hmm. keep people motivated, you know, to actually it, it drives innovation. And this is why, you know, talking about the books, we, we mentioned the books and I know you have a new lunch. Uh, it was last month, right? The mistakes yeah. that makes us. Uh, can you a little bit, you know, and it's very interesting, you know, the title is very, I would say, it hooked me. So mm -hmm. can you give our audience a sneak peek into its central premise and why it's crucial for leaders and leaders and managers? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, th thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, the subtitle of the book tries to summarize it. You know, it's about cultivating a culture of learning and innovation. Um you know, using the word cultivating in, in sort of an intentional way. And, and in fact, that, that, that word was a gift from an old friend of mine who did the artwork uh, for the cover with me. Okay. Um, originally, I was using a word like creating. 
Mm. And I started, you know, thinking about it. I'm like, well, creating a culture that that almost sounds like more of a one time act. We create something. You know, maybe there's an implication of ongoing um, creation or like thinking of words like building. I'm like, that's a little too mechanical. Like you can build a house. Um, <laughs> so cultivating, you know, to me, it's more like. So one of the core themes is thinking of culture like a garden um, of, of something that you have to continually uh, nurture and feed and water and fertilize and protect uh, from pests you know, of different types. It's an ongoing process. And I think culture is similar. But um, yeah, I think some of the core themes of the book is one of the core themes is you know, we, we all make mistakes. Or as many of the guests on my podcast, my favorite mistake, entrepreneurs and CEOs have pointed out, like especially when you're trying to innovate, if you're if you're not making any mistakes, you're you're not pushing the envelope far enough. Mm. You're not real, and if you're you're being too safe, right? So then we think of well, what happens in in an organizational culture that might drive people, and then therefore the company to to really play it safe is if quote unquote failures or mistakes are punished. And so one of the mm -hmm. core themes of the book is, is this idea of shifting from um, punishing mistakes to embracing, if not cherishing or celebrating the mistakes, or more importantly, maybe celebrating the learning, mm -hmm. right? So, um, you know, there, there's one idea I like to poke at, a phrase you hear a lot, I think, in you know, entrepreneurship circles, um, maybe coming out of Silicon Valley, fail early, fail often. Like, I don't... That, to me, that's not really the right way of saying it. I think if we make mistakes early and learn, we're more likely to succeed, right? We don't want to be repeating or excusing the same mistakes over and over again. You know, if anything, um, you know, one other, I think, core theme of the book is it's better in, in, in this, you know, and I'll cite, um, you know, lean startup and other um, entrepreneurship methodologies, this idea of doing small tests in the marketplace. Yeah. This idea comes from Toyota, even if it's continuous improvement in a manufacturing setting of doing a small test of change and being an experimentalist, right? So instead of saying, I have an idea that I know is great, let's roll it out everywhere. You might say, well, wait, wait a minute, I, I might be wrong. Right. Um, let's test the idea. Let's reduce the risk. Let's test the idea on a small scale. Let's, let's adjust from early mistakes um, or, you know, um, opportunities to, to make the idea even better before we start scale. And, and I think right. that that's one of the other themes that hopefully comes through in the book. Um, takeaways, you know, I like to make these takeaways. I like when you mentioned that it's something continuous. It's not like one, one time act because some people, they think I, I take from a little bit technology consultancy approach, we see this, Oh, we're going to do digital transformation. We're going to create a digital transformation uh -huh. strategy. No, it's not creation. It's like, it's a journey that it's like, you need to keep doing it. We need to keep fixing it. We need to take the customer feedback. So this is brilliant, I would say. And the other one, when you mentioned about, you know, uh, failing, I think the famous one is fail fast, they, sure. they say. Um, yeah, and um, I advise everyone, you know, to, read these books and including your book also mal because mm -hmm. then you find out that the best actually products or services that we use today they were able to bring them to what they are because they have failed and they kept mm -hmm. testing until they had the best product or service yeah. that we use so this is something i keep yeah. i keep repeating on the show yeah. now while preparing you know i i saw something you know which also caught my eyes actually and click the regarding management uh, or let's say leadership. Mm -hmm. So, you know, why you, it's a mistake for executives to try to explain the up and downs in business metrics. I mean, you know, there's mm -hmm. KPIs things and, you know, like, what's your take on this? I, I love this one. So this is why I asked. You. Sure. Sure. So my uh, previous book um, is, uh, you know, on this topic. So it's called Measures of Success. The subtitle of that book also tries to um, sort of summarize the idea. The subtitle is React Less, Lead Better, Improve More. And you know, to, to back you know, to your question, I think it is a mistake when leaders are reacting, if not overreacting, to every up and down in some sort of 
business measure, whether that's a company like uh, Toyota or a startup, you know, like Kinexus. Um, there are some measures that basically just fluctuate around an average. Um, you know, the 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 ratio of uh, lifetime customer value to customer acquisition cost. You know, we 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 chart that over time at Kinexus. And, you know, we, we, I think, you know, the leaders there have learned the lesson um, that, that, that I've learned and tried to pass along through the book and, and, and other ways of, okay, well, that number drops a little bit compared to last month. That could be noise, if you will, um, mm. where we're trying to separate signal from noise. And if we're reacting to all the noise and all of our metrics, that, that just ends up consuming a lot of time. When, when there might be you know, certain key metrics that have changed in a statistically meaningful way, and that's the metric to react to. But if we're reacting to everything that got a little bit worse than the last month, that just chews up a lot of time. It distracts us from what might be the core business issues. So there's a method that um, I pass along um, through that book called Process Behavior Charts. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a form of what others might um, no, as statistical process control or control charts that we can apply to business measures. And, you know, basically you, you, know, you create a, a run chart or a line chart of your metric. Um, you calculate an average to see, well, okay, is it just, is it fluctuating around an average or it might be fluctuating around linear growth? But um, let's say, you know, it's a metric that um, is fluctuating around a, a stable horizontal average. Then you calculate two key lines that you then draw on the chart, um, a lower limit and an upper limit that tell us, okay, if that metric continues fluctuating the way it has been, it's going to stay within those lines, within those mm -hmm. hard rails. So now if the metric suddenly goes above or below those limits, that's a time to react. You know, if we have eight consecutive data points that are all above the baseline average or below the baseline average, that's uh, a, another sign of a signal. Right. So if we look at that chart with Kinexus over time, again, you know, that ratio of customer lifetime value to customer acquisition costs, there have been times where there's been step function increases. Yeah. You know, that's worth explaining. Those are, you know, significant changes to the business. Trying to explain those shifts in performance or those signals is a far better use of time than trying to explain um, every small up and down. Don't try to explain the signal do try to understand and explain. Oh, don't, I said that wrong, my mistake. <laughs> don't, try, don't try to explain all of the noise. Do try to understand and explain the signals. And also I understood from you, Mark, like give it some time also, right? Like I'm, I'm talking here maybe from, let's say sales number, revenue number perspective. So maybe there was a major event that happened. So this mm -hmm. is why, you know, the, MRR was down this month. So let's wait like maybe to see next month if things get better. But if you have like maybe three, four, five months consecutively where numbers are wrong, so mm. you need to look at these numbers. So this is why I understand from you, uh, if I'm not mistaken, yeah. right? Well, well yeah. some of it is, is it taking a little bit, uh, looking at a little bit longer time horizon. But there's another mistake a lot of businesses make of, of, of just literally comparing two data points. They'll say, here's the number this month. Here's what it was last month. Or we'll compare mm. it to the same month a year ago. Like those comparisons can be really misleading or at least just incomplete. I'd rather see 12, 24 months, more data points so we can really look to see are there statistically meaningful differences or trends. And I think this makes sense, especially with startups, because we know, you know, this famous graph where in startup you have like, you know, first you go a little bit up, then you go down. And I think I'm, I'm getting this from the book you know, where they, where, you know, the lean startup, where, you know, they, they show the graph where it's go up and then sometimes you have to go down and then you go up again and then you go down until you have this exponent, what they call, it's not exponential, it's like steady growth, we, we sure. call it, right? So 100% mm -hmm. on this. Now, uh, shifting gear a little bit, um, uh, Mark, you've built an impressive personal brand through blogging and podcasting. Can you share this journey? And any advice for anyone who's looking to do the same, including myself? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, welcome, um, you know, to the podcast world. Um, that's a really interesting question. I'll, I'll try to reflect a little bit, hopefully, in a way that's helpful uh, for others. I, I started uh, 
my blog, uh, which is at leanblog.org. I started that early 2005. Mm -hmm. and, and that has evolved and um, changed over time, both, you know, the platform and, and sort of, you know, maybe my, my use of it. Um, but yeah, that really helped establish uh, some greater visibility. You know, that was a, a pre-social media era. Now that I think right. back and, and reflect upon it. Um, so that blog, though, did lead uh, pretty directly to an opportunity to write my first book. Uh, which was called Lean Hospitals. And I, I did that in 2008. Um, I, I, I had kind of the unusual opportunity where a publisher reached out to me because I had been referred to them. They were looking for somebody to mm. write a book, you know, Introduction to Lean Healthcare. And somebody who had been a reader of my blog, who I knew a little bit, um, was having a conversation with the publisher and made a recommendation um, for, for me to do that. So, you know, I my my book wasn't, you know, a lot of times people write great blog posts and it's a series of essays and they can collect those and turn them into a book. That's one reasonable approach. Um, that, that's not the exact path that I took. I, I wrote Lean Hospitals really, you know, from scratch. But writing a blog, you know, I think it, it, it's practice writing, you know, practice articulating ideas. And with a blog, especially back then, people would comment much more often. Like now the discussion tends to happen on LinkedIn. Right. Um, about whatever I've posted, but you get feedback. And, and I think that's helpful. So, you know, thinking of a book as an entrepreneur, um, you, you, you need those cycles of iteration and getting feedback about what's clear, what's compelling, what's helpful and incorporating that into what's, what's then the finished product. So there was blogging and, and that progression um, through writing. And then I, I started my first podcast that was focused on Lean manufacturing, lean healthcare, lean management. Mm -hmm. uh, it was 17 years ago this month. So I started wow. July 2006. And uh, I like to say, um, you know, it sounds like I'm joking, but it's totally true. Like I've been podcasting long enough that it was <laughs> trendy and then it was dying and dead and then it made a comeback. But again, like this was pre smartphone era when it was a lot more difficult for people to listen to podcasts. I mean, I, right. yeah, I don't know if you did the whole, you know, you download MP3 files and you drag them over to your, you know, your dedicated MP3 player. Um, you know, I think with, with the smartphone era, uh, that, that really helped podcasts um, take off and uh, become a lot more common. So, you know, I've, I've done the style of podcasts where I'm, I'm interviewing others. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I enjoy that. There's a, a certain... I don't know, practice or craft um, to, to interviewing people that, that I enjoy as opposed to, you know, some people advocate, well, if, if you want to establish your brand or be the expert, you could do, you know, a solo podcast where it's you talking. I listen to some podcasts that are of that format, but like for me, being able to invite people on my show to be a guest has been a great learning opportunity. Um, you know, it's, it's re really great networking. Um, opportunity. It's a good excuse to reach out to somebody that you want to meet. And <laughs> they, please, please come on, on my podcast. So that that's, you know, part of the reason I've enjoyed that. And then I started, you know, it was one of my pandemic projects. I'll, I'll hold up coffee mug with the logo. My favorite mistake. Ah, nice. Is a, a podcast that I started September, 2020. And then that podcast really inspired the book, uh, the mistakes that make us the you know, the podcast and the book are related. There's a lot of stories from my podcast guests in the book, um, as, as it turned out. So, um, yeah, podcasting has been a lot of fun, you know, 480 episodes of the lean podcast over 17 years and 220 episodes of my favorite mistakes. So that's 700. Wow. Episodes, plus some other podcasting projects that I've done here and there. Nice. Um, and the reason I wanted you to mention this, because I want to um, encourage entrepreneurs, startup founders to do one of two things. Either they start a podcast themselves or to come on podcasts, right? Yeah. Um, so for me, by the way, it's funny enough that I, when I decided to start a podcast, um, I thought like, mm, I got to do solo. <laughs> so yeah. I, was not, I was not sure, can I do interviews? And then all of a sudden people start to reach out hey, mm -hmm. why we don't, you know, talk? And I said, okay, yeah. let me try. 
And then, you know right. what, after the second or third, I said, you know what, I'm enjoying this more. As mm -hmm. you said, exactly for the same reason. First, I'm learning a lot from yeah. people like yourself. Um, second, people are enjoying also as well. They said, Mehmet, like, really, like, from where are you getting these people? I said, yeah, like, okay, there are platforms where you can find, but also sometimes I'm reaching out myself to, to mm -hmm. people that I wish I have. Of course, not all of them. I know busy schedules and so on. And yeah. sometimes... Which is, I think it's a good sign. I'm getting reached out by people who say, can we come to the podcast? I said, of course you can. Be my guest. Like, it's a yeah. learning experience. It's enjoyable. I advise really everyone to do it, whether you want to be on host side, guest side. Like, it's, uh -huh. it's, your, it's your choice. But I think also you mentioned a little bit social media and you started in the pre-social media phase. So how uh -huh. LinkedIn mainly, because, you know, for me, LinkedIn is, is my favorite to go platform although like i have to be everywhere and so on but i mean yeah. linkedin is my go to to reach audience so how how you know you leverage this also to build this thought leadership mm. and you know what tips you can again give you know for people who are interested to expand their influence on on linkedin yeah that's a great question i i don't know if i have that all figured out so i'm trying to think and reflect on what tips you know I, I I would give to others. You know, you, you mentioned earlier um, being included in a program that now called Top Voices. Mm -hmm. um, it was launched as um, LinkedIn influencers up until uh, this year. I think is when they made the change, and um, which is good because when I hear influencer, I think more like Instagram, right? And posing with photos of products and endorsing and and. You know, it's a different idea on um, on LinkedIn. So, you know, I've, I've managed. Thanks, you know, thanks to LinkedIn, I, I'm, I'm appreciative, you know, that they designated me as one of those, quote unquote, top voices um, at least a decade ago. And, and because of that, they recommend to people pretty proactively, oh, you should follow this guy, Mark. And so um, that's really helped build, um, you know, a lot of followers. And, you know, I, I, I try. You know, I do my best to share things that might be, um, you know, interesting. Um, you know, sure, inevitably, uh, you know, part of LinkedIn is, you know, you share what you're doing professionally. Right. And there's that level of, I feel like, you know, this question of like, am I being too overly promotional or, you know, and, you know, trying to, you know, that the, the <laughs> judgment call around that, I guess, right? But I mean, I think there's good guidelines. That I think during a book launch, maybe I've gotten away from of like having a good ratio of sharing industry articles and sharing, you know, other perspectives that that you think are interesting and worth sharing and not making it all about yourself. And I'm saying that out loud as a, a re <laughs> reminder to myself. I apologize that book launch phase maybe has shifted the balance to posting more about um, the book launch. But, um, you know, I think just, you know, trying to share. Um, I, ideas or, you know, even sharing articles from the news and adding some of your thoughts or commentary mm -hmm. to it can be um, a helpful strategy and, you know, in, in engaging people, engaging with people in the discussion. And I think sometimes some of the best learning comes from somebody dis when, you know, somebody disagrees with you. Right. That's something I've tried to get better at, be better about is disagreeing or sharing a contrary opinion in a way that's constructive and helpful right? Um, and, and try to do so in a way that, you know, you, you can sort of say confidently, well, here's what I believe, or here's what my experiences are. Or here's what I was taught and lay it out there in a way that, that doesn't completely diminish. Maybe someone has a different experience. Yeah. So I think, you know, there's a difference between saying, well, my experience is this, is different than saying you're wrong. <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, and it's my way also as well, Mark. And I think, like, even it's funny, but even sometimes when people reach out, you know, like people who send you these emails in LinkedIn and try to position something. So I feel a duty that I need, even if I don't like that, but I feel a duty that I need to tell them in a polite way. Mm -hmm. And sometimes what I do, you know, I do it in a funny way. So yet just yesterday, someone, you know, was positioning for me a service that I offer. And I said, oh, so now we decided to offer the service to people who work in the same field. And I put a smiley face. 
And you know, the other person said, oh, thank you very much. I didn't notice this. And I'm really sorry because I needed yeah. to do more research. Yeah, so, and again, even in public, when there are comments, I like to be constructive, you know, as much mm -hmm. as possible. And yeah, 100%, this helps. And again, this is, I'm saying, it's not to for me or about uh, Mark only. If you are a, a founder, even if you are a tech executive, because we target this audience as well, it's right. good that you keep engaging. Don't be shy, guys. Like, I'm talking to CTOs here, really, like techie right. people. Don't be shy. Like, show your expertise on, on you know, different platforms, podcasts, blogs, uh, because it will build your personal branding. And I'm a big believer now on, on personal branding. It's something that opens a lot of doors for you. So, guys, just do it. Yeah. Uh, as we almost done, um, Mark, so... What, lastly, like I'm curious to know about any upcoming projects or initiatives you're currently working on, and you know what um, you know the audience will would be hearing from Mark in the future. Yeah, um, well, yeah, the, still focused very much on the continued book launch. That's a journey. That that's not a one day or one week event. Um, I just recorded. If I went back yesterday to the recording studio um, to clean up a few mistakes I had made in reading the audiobook version oh. of, of the mistakes that make us. And that's a funny process of, you know, being in a recording booth and you have a sound engineer who's listening. Like sometimes as I was reading, I would like clearly like, okay, I made a mistake. Sorry. Um, let's go back. And the engineer would hear it too. There were times when I didn't notice and the engineer would say, okay, wait, stop. <laughs> you said the wrong word because uh, you know i think you know if you're reading you know you're you're looking ahead you're trying to read smoothly and not just be word right. word 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 i think sometimes just inevitably you're looking four words ahead to think of how you're going to phrase something and your yes. your brain and your mouth say you know the wrong word so he would stop me okay we'll go back and and try it again but then there were the the mistakes that neither of us caught in real time so then yeah. you know, Jeff, the audio engineer, the guy I hired to produce the audio book, um, was going through and editing and listening and, if you will, proofreading. And he caught about, you know, one small mistake per chapter. Yeah. So again, let's uh, come back in and re-record little things. You know, there's, I'm sure there's, I'm sure there's something. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's it amazing. Happens. Um, it happens even with professionals involved. Um, but the audio book will be available maybe within a month. Nice. So that'll be available for people who who prefer um, that format. That'll be my first audio. Well, yeah, first audio book. That's the main thing. And then, you know, I'm working with different organizations, you know, with the new book coming out, um, kind of you know, increasing number of speaking opportunities. So that's, that's one service that I provide for um, organizations. Come in and talk. Uh, with a leadership team or an employee group, um, you know, to share some of these ideas about, you know, trying to be positive about learning from mistakes and, and trying to create that culture. Um, that's something I've really enjoyed doing, working with not just healthcare organizations, but opportunities to come in and, um, you know, spend time with and try to share ideas with companies and other industries. That's kind of the other main thing that I'm doing right now. Where we can find more, Mark? I have the links, but if you want sure. to mention. Well, thanks. Yeah, uh, the book's website is mistakesbook.com or, or people can go to markgraben.com, G-R-A-B-A-N.com or, or people can find me on LinkedIn. You know, my name is um, thankfully unique enough. I think there's one other Mark Graben uh, in the United yes. States. So if you, <laughs> if you search, um, you'll, you'll, probably, you'll probably find me. Yeah, that's great. Now, I have a final question, which is a little bit kind of different. Is there anything you wished I asked you and how you would answer that? Is there anything? Um, that is, and it's funny. Um, like, I, I like to think I'm good at asking questions, which is part of, I think, being a coach or being a podcast host. It's something I wish you had asked. That's that's a tough a tough question to it's say. not that tricky <laughs> i know but trying to think of what direction what direction do we take that in um maybe a question well no i was about to ask like well why why pay attention to toyota i think we we've touched on that um 
I mean, take that question in sort of more of a personal direction. I don't know. I mean, like, do you, do you have a favorite sport? I don't know. I, I'm, I'm struggling with uh, with something else to bring up. So um, I, I I grew up, you know, in the United States. Baseball was really important to me. I know internationally yeah. that's not, you know, as as well known. Um, I'm trying to learn <laughs> football or soccer, as we would call it here. Um, didn't really grow up with that sport. It was just starting to become popular. Like a lot of the kids I grew up with played yeah. soccer, but you know, I, I didn't, I didn't get into that. So I do enjoy though, um, especially attending live, going to a baseball game on a nice day or a nice evening, nice way to spend two and a half, three hours, um, you know, yeah. I do enjoy the game. And especially these days, um, I have a, a favorite player, Shohei Otani. He was a Japanese player um, who's playing uh, in Los Angeles. He's uh, amazing. And um, I don't know, people listening might not care about that. And they might say, Mark, that's a question we shouldn't ask you because it's <laughs> maybe not that interesting. Um, yeah. Well, people think sometimes that I am doing it on purpose to trick, and it's not just because sometimes, you know, I stopped to ask the question because one time the guest told me, hey, we didn't touch base on this. And I said, Okay, sorry, but I thought like I explained what we're going to talk about. So yeah. I decided to come up with this question. And, you know, a lot of times people just did like yourself. So the other day I had a guest who I asked him and he said, hey, why didn't ask me who is my favorite uh, Formula One team or uh, you know, driver? I said, okay. Right. And some people, they, they get stuck. They said, you asked everything. Like we don't have anything left. So yeah. just I like to put it as a space. Really, if I forget something or maybe some topic sure. we jump very quickly on. Well, Mark, thank you very much for being with me today. I really Thanks appreciate so the time. I really enjoyed the conversation. Uh, and again, I will put the links to the book and to Mark's website and his LinkedIn profile in the episode description. So if you are yeah. listening on your favorite podcasting platform, you can find that in the description. If you are watching this, again, you find it there. And again, as I end every episode, if you have any question, any feedback about this episode or the show in general, I would love to hear it. I would love to know what you are liking, what you are disliking. If you want to see any change, uh, if you want like specific topics to be discussed. And also, if you are interested to be a guest with me, I would invite you to come and join me. I don't have any time constraints. Yes, I'm based in Dubai, but you see, Mark is in the US. Yeah. You know, I had some guests from Canada. I mean, that part of the world. I had people even in New Zealand on the other side. They are plus 12 hours from me. So. Right. I can accommodate the time zones. No worries at all about that. And the aim of the show is to bring, you know, minds and expertise similar to Mark and all the guests that I had till now and spread this knowledge. And, you know, even it's the CTO, again, it's technology, entrepreneurship, startups all coming together. And thank you for tuning in and we'll meet again next episode. Thank you. Bye-bye. Hit that subscribe button, share the show with your tech-savvy friends and fellow entrepreneurs, and leave us a review on your favorite podcast app. Your support means the world to us.